Good day everyone. For Telesera, I'm Cody Weddle in Caracas, Venezuela. 61 corpses have been found in an abandoned crematorium in the state of Guerrero, Mexico. It's a discovery that only adds to the growing sense of lawlessness, corruption and violence in that country. The decomposing bodies, which have yet to be identified, were discovered in the tourist city of Acapulco after neighbors complained of a foul smell. The new finding follows the murder two days ago of a social justice, justice activist who was organizing protests. He planned to protest over the, the case of the 43 students forcibly disappeared in September, also in the state of Guerrero. For the latest on this breaking story, we go to our correspondent, Clayton Kahn. At least 61 decomposing bodies were found in an abandoned crematorium in the Mexican resort city of Acapulco, Guerrero, the same, uh, the same state where the 43 Ayotzinapa students were disappeared by local police in September. The discovery was made on Thursday after neighbors in the area reported a strong odor coming from the installations. Now, Guerrero state authorities have said that the bodies were all covered by sheets or lime powder in two rooms. According to information that has been reported thus far, the bodies show no signs of torture. However, the neighbors in the area say the facility has been abandoned for more than a year, prompting the question as to why the bodies would be in those facilities. Now, some reports say that two individuals are being questioned by Guerrero uh, state authorities. They are believed to be the owners of the property. Now, Guerrero has been the focal point of corruption, organized crime, and violence for years, with the city of Acapulco being considered one of the most violent cities. This is Clayton Khan reporting for Telesur here in Mexico City. And as discoveries like this continue, many Mexicans are calling for a constituent assembly to rewrite the nation's constitution. Spearheaded by social movements, the initiative has been launched in light of recent massacres and the Mexican government's neoliberal reforms, which are privatizing key industries. Esta propuesta de la constituyente tiene que ser una respuesta a la búsqueda y a los anhelos de cambio, a la sed tremenda de justicia de la gente. Shares in Brazil's state-controlled oil giant Petrobras have fallen 6% on news that President Dilma Rousseff has named Aldemir Bindain as the new head of the company. On Wednesday, the previous CEO, Graça Foster, a longtime confidant of the president, was forced to resign over allegations of corruption in Petrobras. The new man in charge is the former head of the state-owned Banco de Brasil. Market forces were hoping to see someone from the private sector appointed. Ike Batista, once Brazil's richest man, has seen his assets frozen by a judge in Rio de Janeiro. Batista went on trial last November for insider dealing and could face up to 12 years in prison. Following the judge's order, federal police began to seize cars, jewelry, and works of art at two homes belonging to the former oil and mining magnate in Rio's Hajim Botanico neighborhood. Arrangements are underway for a meeting of UNICEF foreign ministers in the coming days to discuss the new round of sanctions being imposed on Venezuela by the United States. The encounter follows a visit by UNICEF head Ernesto Sampa to Caracas earlier this week. Speaking during a televised interview Thursday night, Ecuadorian Foreign Minister Ricardo Patino said it was vital that other countries in the region defend Venezuela from destabilization attempts. Fundamental. Protecting Venezuela is fundamental not only in terms of the sovereignty they possess over their oil and their natural resources, but also in order to avoid a situation that could affect peace in our region. We are taking care of ourselves and this is one of the most important strengths that we have in South America and the Caribbean. We have a development process that is very positive and we have to protect it from foreign intervention. Meanwhile, here in Venezuela, community members are organizing to put an end to the hoarding and speculation that has characterized the economic war against the country. Community inspectors are taking it upon themselves to supervise private businesses suspected of fraud and to help educate others on the problems with panic shopping and excessive consumerism. 
People are being selfish and are buying excessive amounts of things. What's going on? People need to understand that we are in a war without even a single shot being fired. People need to be aware that this isn't happening in vain. It's being done on purpose because the opposition wants to get rid of the government elected by the people. According to a new report, Colombians are becoming increasingly optimistic about the country's peace process. Negotiations between the FARC guerrillas and the government do continue. For more, we go to our correspondent, Natalia Margarita. ha convocado a la insurgencia. Asistimos a este diálogo. Obviously we have some problems with that report and we're going to move on. Farmers in the community of Monrepos in St. Lucia are helping to boost food security in their area. They have embarked on a program geared at self-sufficiency and greater food production while adopting sustainable agriculture practices. Farmers say government is expected to assist nationals, but sometimes it is just as important to look out for oneself and each other. Through this program, the farmers are working together for a common purpose, to remain in business and ensure local food production. Bernard John Baptist says the project uses sustainable agricultural practices as farmers grapple with the effects of climate change. Um, if we notice over the past year, the kind of experience we have had with, with, with the weather, it has been more hotter than cold. You, you get a lot more heat than rain now. So all practices you engage in, it has to be get at conserving moisture. Paul Francis heads the program. He says it will concentrate on organic farming. And to pesticides, fertilizers, all our practices. In fact, well, we don't even um, really burn the, the soil. We don't use any gromach zone. We'll be using things like basta, which is an organic um, 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 herbicide. Those involved in the program say this model of communal farming has proven successful in many countries, and those who earn their living from the land have benefited from sharing knowledge and practices to boost production. The farmers say the goal of this program is to ensure a sustainable future for themselves and their families. From Castry St. Lucia, Alison Kentish for Telesu English. And thanks to Allison. Taking a look around the world now, according to rebel leaders, a temporary ceasefire has be, been agreed upon in eastern Ukraine to evacuate citizens from fighting areas. Leaders from the Donetsk People's Republic announced the ceasefire from Moscow, where they will meet with uh, officials from Kiev and Europe to discuss longer term solutions. Kiev officials, however, have not confirmed any formal truce. The offer was made to the Ukrainian side to completely cease fighting at 9 a.m. The Ukrainian side agreed with that so that the process of evacuation of civilians to the humanitarian corridors will not be disrupted. After their surprise visit to Kiev on Thursday, the Chancellor of Germany and the President of France are now in Moscow for talks with Russian President Vladimir Putin. The three leaders will discuss a, a new initiative to halt the growing conflict in Ukraine U.S. Vice President Joe Biden has tried to downplay the talks, alleging that Putin has violated all agreements to end the conflict. NATO, on the other hand, has expressed full support for the dialogue. During a visit to Brussels on Friday, U.S. Vice President Joe Biden told European Union officials that they must stand together over Ukraine as fighting continues in the east of the country. While criticizing Russian President Vladimir Putin for his alleged involvement in the region, Western leaders are at odds over the possibility of arming the Ukrainian government of Petro Poroshenko. Celebration continued in Greece Thursday night with over 4,000 people gathering in front of the parliament in Athens. The gathering came as a show of support for the new Syriza-led government and their plans to renegotiate the country's massive debt. The new prime minister Alexis Tsipras and finance minister Yanis Yaropakis have been lobbying across Europe all week to win over allies for their anti-austerity plan. 
On Thursday, Minister Varoufakis was unable to reach an agreement with his German counterpart on how to solve the debt crisis. As Dr. Schäuble said, we didn't reach an agreement. It was never on the cards that we would. We didn't even agree to disagree from where I'm standing. From where I'm standing, we agreed to enter into deliberations as partners with a joint orientation towards a European solution for European problems. Hundreds of Palestinians demonstrated outside the former Egyptian embassy in Gaza City Friday. The action came in protest of a recent court decision to ban a Hamas armed faction from the country and declare it a terrorist group. Egypt outlawed the military wing of Hamas last week as part of President al Sisi's crackdown on the Islamist movement. The involvement of the Egyptian judiciary in this political game does not add anything new to the bitter reality of the current Egyptian policy, which is against the Palestinian people in Gaza. And as Palestinians protest Egypt's decision, the humanitarian situ situation in Gaza is only worsening. Our correspondent Noor Harazin has more. Despite the fact that the situation in the Gaza Strip is uh, calm, if we're talking about Israeli attacks on the coastal enclave, uh, however, the humanitarian situation is really bad. Yesterday, uh, several Hamas officials said that the situation could explode in the Gaza Strip and the residents could explode because of all the crisis that they are facing. The Gaza Strip is currently facing a lack of clean water, lack of electricity, where the electricity blackout hours are up to 18 hours per day in the uh, Gazans' homes. At the same time, the hospitals are suffering lack of medicine and medical supplies. Also, all the borders are closed. There is rarely any goods that do enter the Gaza Strip these days. Thanks to Noor. The search continues for victims of the Trans-Asia flight that crashed shortly after takeoff in Taipei on Wednesday. 15 pe people survived the crash, while 35 people have so far been confirmed dead. Eight remain missing. The plane banked steeply away from buildings and crashed into an elevated road as the pilot tried to avoid populated areas. This is the second deadly crash for Trans-Asia in less than a year. And on a wintry note, a lighter note, Japan began its 66th Snow Festival Friday with elaborate sculptures filling the north of the country. Heavy snowfall arrived just in time for this year's Sapporo Snow Festival, which features over 204 snow and ice sculptures. The main attraction this year is Darth Vader and his loyal stormtroopers. Organizers expect the seven-day festival to attract 2.5 million visitors. On another cultural note, a little cafe in South Korea has a unique way to attract customers and honor the year of the sheep. They do it by housing two of the furry critters that can be petted by customers. According to the lunar calendar, February 19th, 2015 marks the start of the year of the sheep. The animal symbolizes kindness, humility, and respect for parents. And February 6th marks what would have been the 70th birthday of famed Jamaican singer Bob Marley. Marley was considered a revolutionary for his willingness to address themes of poverty and injustice in his music. He became one of the first mu musicians from the Global South to gain international recogni recognition. Marley died of cancer in 1981. More on those and other stories at our website, telesurtv.net slash English for Telesur English. I'm Cody Waddle. Have a great Friday. Have a great weekend.